in the next several sessions, when I present, I will introduce you to topics that Dr. Levine talks in generalities about, and I will be more specific as it relates to the old cabinet. All right, so if he talks about innate immunity, which I understand he gave a lecture yesterday on, I'm going to focus on how innate immunity works in the oral cavity. All right, what elements do we know about that exist in saliva, for example, that are essential to defend um, us from all kinds of challenges, whether they're bacterial, viral, or fungal. Um, and these uh, agents that are found in saliva are primarily produced in the salivary glands, in acini of both the serum mucus and the serous glands. They're released, they come into the oral cavity, and there are a lot of them. And I'm going to focus on a few of them. And um, a second set of innate immune uh, agents come from the epithelium. Okay, so you've got the saliva, the fluid phase, and you've got the more static phase, which is the epithelium, the mucosa itself. Um, and these are primarily uh, peptides, uh, antimicrobial, and immunoregulatory. And so the, the, the take home message here is the oral cavity is to a great degree unique in the sense that it has a lot of agents that are part of the innate immune system probably more than any other site in the human uh, body. Um, now, what you see up here are things I want you to stress, uh, I, I want to stress in the course, because we're going to be talking about some of these things. So there's a, a paper that appeared in 2013 by Barthold and Van Dyke. Now, this has to do with periodontitis. And when we discuss periodontitis in a couple of weeks, uh, the immunology of periodontitis and the microbiology of periodontitis. I want to emphasize the fact that periodontitis is a mixed infection. It's not one bug, one disease. It's a lot of bugs in concert in order to produce an outcome that we refer to as periodontitis. So it's a mixed infection. But the big question that's been haunting the, 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 the profession, if you will, dentistry, is what's the culprit? What's the cause, the actual cause of the disease? Is it strictly microbial? <coughs> is it strictly host response? Is it a combination of the two? And over the 20th century, there's been constant debate as to whether the bug or the host is really responsible for the outcome. Because there are individuals who are predisposed more than others. So there could be a genetic component. given assuming that the bugs are the same bugs. And then there's this constant um, uh, stress on the part of the microbiologists that the bugs have certain unique properties, which is true. It really can destroy the periodontium. But these bugs, host people say, are commensal, meaning, what is commensal? Yeah, go ahead. They normally exist in the oral microflora. Yeah, they're, they're part of the microflora, the normal microflora in our mouths, right? It's not mycobacterium tuberculosis, which causes severe lung disease. It's not uh, clostridium, clostridium difficile, uh, C. diff. It's not salmonella uh, diffimorium, which causes severe gastrointestinal diseases. Because these are organisms that are not part of the commensal microflora. So the big question is, are the organisms that we're going to be talking about that have been implicated in periodontal disease, to what degree are they really pathogens? So there's this constant debate. The next two reviews by Hashish and Gallus is a really neat new development in, in the field. And it really comes from work being done in the gastrointestinal tract. So there's this concept now, being, now emerging called keystone pathogens, dysbiosis. Um, and, and when I talk about keystone pathogens, there are certain organisms that are referred to as commensal, which when they emerge, 
in the context of the other organisms, they can shift the community so that it becomes pathogenic as a whole community. And this is kind of interesting because there's an organism called Porphyrmonas gingivalis. Anyone heard of that organism before? PG? Okay. So PG has been studied a lot. And PG is a kind of organism that is now referred to as a keystone pathogen. It's part of the commensal microflora. You do PCR analysis of, of plaque from healthy people and even healthy sites, and you'll find it. But what happens is the moment something occurs where it emerges at higher levels, all of a sudden it <coughs> promotes a shift in the community from a commensal slash symbiotic community to a commensal slash dysbiotic community. Meaning that organism can promote dysbiosis. What does that conjure up in your mind, dysbiosis? When you hear the word dysbiosis, what do you think it means? This is the way I'm going to be lecturing. Chaos. Chaos. Yeah. Absolutely. You've got a situation where the host responds normally and predictably to a challenge. And what this organism does is it subverts the host response. And we're going to be talking about that subversion because this is really new stuff over the last four or five years. It's really taken the perinomal um, community by storm and it's all because of what's going on in the gastro community in terms of dysbiosis occurring in the gut by keystone pathogen. And when this keystone pathogen emerges and starts pr to, pr to, to change the host response either by a neutrophil not getting there or if the neutrophil is trying to perform phagocytosis it's not doing it well. The same is true with the myeloid cell. What happens is the organisms persist. And these organisms then shift into a form of organisms that are referred to as pathobionts. That's another term that we'll talk about. So this normal commensal microflora, because of a keystone pathogen, shifts the microflora into pathobionts, and they become important in the promotion of inflammation. What's interesting is that PG, in the initial stages of the infection, is stealth-like. It doesn't want the immune system, the innate immune system, um, to respond aggressively. It wants to be below the radar screen. It wants to emerge, it wants to continue to colonize, it has the capacity to, to be intracellular, it can go into the epithelial cell, it can go into the neutrophil, it can change the phenotype of that cell. You've heard of interleukin-8, IL-8, Dr. Levine tell you about IL-8. IL-8 is a really neat chemokine because it's specific for for chemotaxis of what cell. You should know that by now. The neutrophil, exactly. The neutrophil is that first line of defense that comes in when an initial onslaught, initial challenge occurs. So there is a gradient of IL-8 in, in the, in the uh, mucosa, in the oral cavity. That's unique to the oral cavity. Most other mucosa of the body don't have a gradient violate. And this is usually caused by tweaking of that mucosa by commensal microflora. So there's percolation of PMNs, a couple of PMNs here, a couple there. They even have resident dendritic cells. Do you remember the name of the resident dendritic cell in the oral mucosa? Langerhans cells. Okay, so those are cells that play a role in the early stages of defense. So what we're going to be doing, and I need you to look at these last two papers, the reviews of what is known about 
keystone pathogens, dysbiosis, subversion of the immune response, and pathobiome. All right? Okay. <laughs> so, I like to start off by uh, talking about objectives. What do I need? What do I want you to know? What you should know in terms of uh, innate immunity, oral innate immunity. This is kind of redundant because I would suspect that Dr. Levine already described to you the difference between innate and adaptive immunity. All right, so this, uh, I, may, I may not uh, stress that. Did he talk to you about pathogen-associated molecular patterns and pattern recognition receptors? Well, I'm going to emphasize it as it relates to the oral cavity. Okay, this is really neat. This is, I think, over the last 15 years has really revolutionized our understanding of how inflammation actually occurs. So these pathogen-associated molecular patterns, as you know, are bacterial or molecular. They're molecules that are not produced by us. They're produced by a foreign, by an organism, by a fun fungus, by a uh, bacteria, by a virus. And it's recognized by these pattern recognition receptors. Did he talk to you about toll, toll-like receptors? Yes. All right, so we're going we're gonna to emphasize that a little bit. Did he talk about nuclear factor kappa B, transcription factors? Maybe not. All right, we're going to go into that a little bit because it's real important to understand how a cell, and these are all cells of our body, have toll-like receptors on them. So all cells have the capacity to recognize foreign agents that are produced by these microbes. All right? So once the toll-like receptor identifies the agent, it causes a lot of things to occur within the cell. And a signal transduction event occurs where a cascade of phosphorylation events occurs in the cell that leads to the activation of a transcription factor called nuclear factor kappa B, NF kappa B. And when that gets freed up from the cytoplasm, it goes into the nucleus and identifies and binds to promoter regions of specific genes that encode for cytokines and chemokines. So that's a really, really important uh, concept to, to grasp. All right, I created this thing called oral mucosal strategy. I want you to tell me whether it's worth understanding it that way or not. I created it a couple years ago, and uh, some people like it. Other people think it's, it's not really helpful, but I'm going to give it a shot. And you tell me whether you think it's uh, it, it kind of takes the dynamic of the oral cavity and says, and separates. Yes, contact info for this show. I'm so sorry. That's all right. <laughs> and separates the dynamic into a liquid phase, a static phase, and a recruitment phase. So in the oral cavity, what am I referring to with the liquid phase? Saliva. What am I referring to with the static phase? Teeth. What? Teeth. No. Uh, the tissue. Hmm? The tissue. Tissue. The mucosa. You know, you could be right to some degree. Teeth. I didn't think about teeth. But the teeth don't respond the way the mucosa does. A, a, a tooth is something inert. And what's on the tooth is the pellicle. And we'll talk about the pellicle at some point because that is extremely important in the establishment of the early colonizers, which is a good thing in the oral cavity. You want to have indigenous organisms emerging when the tooth erupts so that it can protect the tooth from exogenous organisms trying to get in from the outside, like staph or like E. coli. So there is something to be said about teeth, but I'm referring more to the mucosa because the mucosa will respond um, with agents not dissimilar from what I'm going to be talking about in saliva. And then there's a recruitment phase. What am I referring to? Blood vessels. So there's stuff emerging from the epithelium in response to a challenge, which is sending signals to cells 
in the blood vessels to get out of those blood vessels and come and help out in an area of infection. So those are the three things related to the oral mucosal strategy that we'll talk about. Uh, I'm going to focus on the agents of innate immunity from the salivary glands uh, that are found uh, in saliva. And I'm going to be referring to the innate immune agents that appear from epithelial cells in the mucosa. And we're going to put it all together and try and grasp what can happen when some of these agents are missing. Okay? So that has to do with objectives. Stop me if there's any questions. The outline of the course, uh, of the lecture, adaptive, innate immunity, oral mucosal strategy. Now these are agents that I'm going to be referring to. Mucin. You've heard of mucin? Yes. Yeah. So a couple of different kinds of mucins. They play different roles in the oral cavity. They're not just important for lubrication, but they really play a non-specific role in innate immunity in order to, what do you think it does? Conjure up in your mind, what would, what would mucin do in the oral cavity if it's non-specific and it relates to innate immunity? What do you think mucin can do? Huh? Bind, bind to bacteria. Yeah, so it can bind to bacteria non-specifically. It's really the greatest way to get rid of excess bacteria in our mouth. We have over 700 species of bacteria, we have billions of bacteria, right? And if we didn't have mucins, maybe we'd have something else instead of mucins, but mucins play this role of non-specifically adhering to bacteria, and we'll explain how that happens, in the oral cavity so that we can swallow those excess bacteria and kill them. Okay, so that plays a very, very important role. Then lysozyme, lactoferrin, salivary peroxidase, histatins, proline rich peptides, staphrin. Proline rich peptide and staphrin. These are two very important molecules from the saliva that bathe the teeth. These are anchoring molecules that are extremely important for bacteria to, especially those early colonizers, to bind to the bacteria, to bind to the teeth through these anchoring molecules so that those teeth are protected. When we talk about caries, and we talk about Streptococcus mutans, for example, okay, that's an early colonizer, early in the sense that it requires the tooth in order to bind, because we have other streptococcal organisms that appear and specifically bind soft tissue. When the baby is born, there are no teeth in the oral cavity. So those streptococcal organisms that have a predilection for soft tissue bind the soft tissue. Strep salivarius, strep mitis, they love to bind to soft tissue. Then there are these other good bugs, strep sanguinis, actinomyces type gram-positive organisms. They have a strong affinity for these kinds of molecules. Proline-rich peptides, staphrin. So they have a tremendous affinity for these molecules. They bind to the teeth readily. Strep mutans, on the other hand, is a poor binder to these agents, which is a good thing. But when we talk about caries, what we'll do is we will discuss how, what strategy strep mutans uses to circumvent the poor affinity it has for these molecules. So I want to bring that to your attention. Then, the epithelial cell-derived antimicrobial peptides. These are agents released by the mucosa in response to a challenge. They're being studied a lot. Some of them turns out to be antimicrobial. Some turn out to be not just antimicrobial, but also immunoregulatory. They are <coughs> discovered to be ancient chemokines. They're not actual chemokines that we refer to in the general context of cytokines. These are small peptides released by epithelial cells that have an incredible ability to 
selectively chemoattract either T cells or myeloid cells or PMS. Okay, so there's an additional way by which the epithelium can recruit these agents, these cells, from the bloodstream to protect us. Do you have a question? Are those referring to things like human basic defenses? Yes. But there are others that we'll talk about. So that's essentially the story over today and next, next time we meet. This is the only clinical slides I'm going to show you today. Look at those three panels. Look carefully at those three panels. Describe to me what you see. I'll make it easier. You see that there? You see that there? You see that there? What's the common denominator? What? That's white. That's just shiny. I don't think that's white. That's clearly not white. Well, there's something in there that's white. Yeah. But that's not where I'm going. Huh? They're all localized. They're localized. That's true. That's one. I can tell you that two out of those three are self-inflicted. That's in response to a cheek bite. That's in response to a tongue bite. And that's in response to a local anesthetic. All right? But well, having said that, what's the common denominator? Think about the oral cavity. Is the oral cavity a sterile place? Not in any way. It's pretty gruesome, right? Um, so what you see here is a situation where the mucosal barriers have been disrupted. Right? How many times have we bitten our tongue or bitten our cheek or bitten our lip or burned our palate from hot soup? Right? A lot of times. And yet nothing happens. Think about that. And why is that? All right, it's because of agents that we have in the saliva and in the epithelium that protect us from these kinds of constant barrier breakup or challenges. The antimicrobial peptides, these beta defensins that you mentioned, were discovered in the tongue in response to this kind of lesion. Around the area of the wound, all of a sudden they emerged. They were isolated, they were shown to be very antibacterial. And then we found them. So we have ways to protect those self-inflicted wounds. Then there's the saliva that washes this with all the agents that I mentioned to you in the previous slide. So self-inflicted wounds, and to a great degree, even after surgery, you'll notice that a lot of surgical procedures are done in the oral cavity, and yet people heal quickly. And these wounds heal quicker, oftentimes, than they do on the skin. Because though all these agents that I'm talking about are there to protect us, so that if an oral <coughs> surgeon makes a mistake, we don't die. Who wants to be an oral surgeon? OK. You won't make mistakes. All right, this is just a rub on topic that I really love. Innate immunity is one of my favorite topics. And these guys got the Nobel Prize in 2011 for it. This guy in the middle, Jules Hoffman, identified, toll, and identified agents that toll interacts with in the fruit fly. I don't know if Dr. Levine mentioned this to you. But he got, he shared the Nobel Prize in 2011. The guy over here, Bruce Fugler, took Jules Hoffman's findings and relay them to humans. So the toll-like receptors that I'm going to be talking to you about really are, is work from Bruce Mutley. And this guy, Ralph Steinman, who received the Nobel Prize posthumously, the only person to receive the Nobel Prize, um, 
as a, as a dead person is because the Nobel Committee gave him the prize without knowing that he had passed away. He died on a Friday, and on Saturday they, they gave him the Nobel Prize. They didn't know that, that he had passed away. But he was real important because of his discovery that dendritic cell and the role in adaptive memories. The dendritic cell plays a real important role in bridging between innate and adaptive immunity. You know the story of a, a dendritic cell? What is it supposed to do? It recognizes invaders and it, if I remember correctly, I actually ripped from a part and puts part of them onto itself yeah. to tell everyone. Yeah, so, so antigens of the bug can get onto the pseudopodia of, of the dendritic. It looks like a star-shaped kind of cell. And it go, where does it go? Lymph nodes. And there it activates T cells and B cells, right? Well, this guy Steinman was able to discover a lot of the things that we take for granted today in terms of that sort of activity. The reason I bring this up is because innate immunity is a very, very hot topic. Okay. Evolutionarily ancient and conserved. I mentioned to you that it was first discovered in the fruit fly. And we have, to a great degree, inherited that aspect of defense that the fruit fly that lives about seven or eight days doesn't have the luxury of memory, uses innate immunity to really protect itself from all kinds of different challenges, microbial challenges, primarily fungal. So these agents that we're going to be talking about were first discovered in, um, in insects. It's the body's first line of defense against infection. That's pretty obvious. Mechanical barriers um, uh, at body surface. When I was studying dentistry um, in the 70s and early 80s, innate immunity was seen as exactly that, barriers. The mucosa was a barrier. And you did everything you could to prevent bacteria from going through that barrier. But we had no understanding about the dynamic of the mucosa that we do today. Non-specific, no memory. There's no need for having um, or, or experiencing the agent, the antigen, beforehand in order to build memory. Right? There's no need for that. They're preformed. They're ready to be released. Released within the first 90 minutes of an onslaught, if not earlier. Rapid response, as I said. Antimicrobial substances and secretions. So lysozyme and lactoferrin are examples of things that we're going to be talking about. Have you heard of lysozyme? Okay, who, who brought that one up? Who brought that topic up? Karyology. And karyology. Okay, so we have lysozyme in the saliva. Do you remember what it's supposed to do? It kills bacteria, yeah. How does it do it? Yes. What part of the cell wall? Huh? Nam nag. What is nam nag part of? Peptidoglycan. Right? That's the skeleton of the organism. We're going to talk about that as to how lysozyme does its thing. Lactoferrin. What do we know about lactoferrin? Yes. Well, it does it, but what does it do before it transports it? It sequesters it. It needs to be able to compete with the bacteria for iron. Ferrocyan, Fe plus 2, right? Because iron is an agent that bacteria use for viability and virulence. So if we have an agent that competes with it, we may be able to reduce the virulence capacity of the organism. The low pH of the stomach is seen as part of the innate immune system. It's very, very, very low, and most bacteria can't thrive in it. <coughs> the best example, now, uh, have you had compliment yet? No, okay, so I don't have, I won't be introducing it, Dr. Levine will, but I'll be, every now and again mentioning it. 
So complement is probably the best studied um, component of innate immunity, especially the alternate complement pathway. There is the classical pathway, and then there is the alternate pathway. And why is that important? Because the alternate complement pathway can get induced without any help from the adaptive immune system. Zero help. The classical requires antibody presence. This does not. This only requires bacterial associated molecular patterns, right? Bacterial agents like LPS. You've heard of LPS? You've heard of lipotychoic acid from gram positives? These are molecules that are recognized by toll. This has nothing to do with toll. This was discovered long before toll was. But it's a cascade of events that leads to the maturation and eventual covering of the bug by complement by, by agents that mature in the complement cascade that bind to the surface of the organism that promote the breakdown of that organism because the eventual composition of the complement is referred to as membrane attack complex or MAC and it's made up of specific subgroups of complement that bind to the surface of the organism and poke holes in its memory. So we'll touch upon it. I know that Dr. Levine is going to go into detail about it, but I just wanted to bring to your attention that the alternate complement pathway is part of the innate immune system. Okay. So this is a little redundant, but I just want to stress it. I can't tell you how important this is. So you know about PAMPs, you know about lipopolysaccharide, peptidoglycan, lipotychoic acid, flagella. These sugars, mannans, bacterial DNA or CPG DNA, glucans. We're going to talk about glucans when it comes to the topic of caries. So glucans are really extracellular polysaccharides that gram-positive bacteria produce in response to the presence of sugar. So now we're going to be focusing a lot on sucrose, right? It's a disaccharide, glucose and fructose. Streptomutans produces a tremendous glucan, I'm kind of hinting to some of its virulence capacity. So these glucans are very, very sticky. And the bug knows to take the sucrose, cut it, and make long chains of glucose or long chains of fructose. And those long chains are the glucans that become the extracellular polysaccharide of the bug that permits it to bind to another bug and to the tooth. So these are things that are referred to as pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Again, all of these agents are not produced by us. They're all produced by foreign microbes unrelated to us. Toll-like receptors. So the idea of toll-like receptors really was started, again, by uh, Jules Hoffman's group and others and a guy by the name of Charlie Janeway at Yale, who should have gotten the Nobel Prize, but he died before. And, and the committee knew that he passed away, so there was no way he was going to get it. That's a shame. Anyway, he was really responsible for making a, a great inroads into understanding how these toll-like receptors function, how they recognize these other camps. And what happens when a pattern recognition receptor, like a toll-like receptor, interacts with a PAMP? We now have about 10 or 11 toll-like receptors identified on our cells. What's interesting is that these toll-like receptors can uniquely react with specific PAMPs. All right? 
So there is toll-like receptor 4, for example, which interacts with LPS. There's an exception, and that is PG's LPS. It was first identified to react with toll-like receptor 2. That is an exception to the rule. Uh, TLR2 interacts with peptidoglycan and interacts with other peptides, lipopeptides, lipoproteins. So these are things that science has discovered step by step in regards to toll-like receptors. Bacterial flagella. Flagella, you've heard of flagella. So these are these extracellular structures that give motility to the bacteria that express them. So the flagellin, which makes up flagella, is recognized by toll-like receptor 5. Bacterial DNA is recognized by toll-like receptor 9. I don't have all the list here. I'm just bringing it to your attention um, because there is selectivity in the ability of TLRs to interact with PAMs. Now, they interact homodimerically, which means, for example, two units of TLR2 in order to activate the signal transduction pathway in the cell. They need to be homodimerized or heterodimerized, like a TLR2 with a TLR1 or a TLR2 with a TLR6. Homodimerization, heterodimerization. That will work to activate the pathway. At the end of the day, in this cascade of events, there is something called nuclear factor kappa B, NF kappa B. That is a transcription factor. And when, the, when you hear about transcription factors, conjure up in your mind an agent that is going from the cytoplasm into the nucleus, binds to specific regions of specific genes to activate those genes. That's what a transcription factor does. So I'm going to show you some stuff. Well, first of all, just to refresh your memory. Everyone here has taken microbiology in, in undergrad? Every, no one. Not everyone. But most of you. All right, this is for those people who haven't, because I want to bring you up to speed on this stuff. Look at both figures. <coughs> look at the top figure and look at the lower figure. Look at this and look at this. Tell me what you see and how they differ. This is a representation of gram-positive bacteria, membrane, and this is, or cell wall, and this is a representation, the lower one, of gram-negative. What do you see? Yeah? Gram-positives have a bigger cell wall, and gram-negatives have LPS. Uh, okay, so don't equate cell wall with LPS in the sense, what you said was they have bigger cell wall, and the, and the other ones have LPS. Okay, I want you to say this. The gram-positives have a bigger cell wall because of a huge peptidoglycan, as opposed to a smaller one in the gram-negatives. The peptidoglycan and gram-positive bacteria make up about 80% of that cell wall. The membrane, the outer membrane of gram-negatives, that peptidoglycan makes up less than 20%. So that's one big difference. In regards to LPS, yes, if I'm going to ask you, true or false, gram-positive bacteria express LPS. True or false? False. Gram-negative bacteria express lipotycholic acid. True or false? False. The lipotycholic acid is the equivalent of LPS in gram-negative. So, Lipotycholic acid, LTA, the sugar alcohol phosphate polymers, appear only in gram-positive bacteria. And they're very, very much involved in adherence, both interbacterially and between bacteria and host cells. But another major role that they play is they're very inflammatory. LPS. Lipo, lipopolysaccharide. Lipo 
polysaccharide. What's that telling you? It has sugar. It has lipid, right? The sugar part of it sticks out onto the surface. It's, it's described here like this. So this is the outside. This is going into the bug. So right here is the polysaccharide part of the LPS. So if it's exposed, what's that going to do vis-a-vis -vis the host? Put your immuno immunology hat on. If something is exposed on the surface, and that something is not what we recognize as self, what's going to happen? Yes, how is it going to activate the immune response? Okay, what part of the adaptive immune response is going to kick in? Adaptive immunity. What part of the adaptive immunity? If you've got a foreign agent, and I'm saying the adaptive immune response is going to respond, what part of it is? What are we going to get in response to these foreign agents identified as being foreign? What's going to be produced? Antibodies. Because these are seen as antigens. So the polysaccharide part of the molecule in the organism that sticks out is going to be recognized by us as foreign and we're going to produce antibodies to it. Right? So these guys are very antigenic. These guys are antigenic. Anything that sticks out of the bug is going to be identified as antigenic. Now if the bug breaks up, which is often going to happen, then all of a sudden this gets, this gets exposed on the inner side of the gram-negative bacteria and that's going to become <coughs> So we're going to have antibodies to all of these. That's from, the hum that's from the humoral adaptive immune side of it. But when we talk about the innate immune, we don't need any of that stuff because we've got toll-like receptors that can identify. Anyone ever do a gram stain? Did you ever do a gram stain? You did. Okay. Explain to me, if you recall, what are the agents of Graham stain. This guy Graham was a genius back in the 19th century. Because if you understand how Graham stains work, you can clearly understand the difference between these two membranes. What do you recall in the Graham stain? Huh? How about colors? Purple. Purple and orange or pink or whatever, right? Okay. Now, what was the what, what do you recall being the purple? That's, that, that's the first step. You take a slide, you got a gram positive slide, you gram, got a gram negative slide. You don't know which is which. So you're going to put crystal violet on both of them first, right? Then you wash. Both membranes are going to be purple. Both bugs, both types of bugs are going to be purple. Then what do you do? Uh, huh? Yes. And what's the alcohol going to do? Wash on what? Lipids. Which one of these membranes has lipids? The gram negative. So now you're going to wash out the lipids from the gram negative membrane. And you come in and, and you don't wash out anything from the gram positive. Now then you come in with Saffron. That's the orange color or the pink color. This is going to be devoid of the lipids. The orange is going to come in and it's going to stain these guys orange. That's the whole gram stain. And that's why this thing works. This is devoid of lipids and this is full of lipids. Lipopolysaccharide, lipoprotein. Okay? So that's, that's something that's worth remembering. Okay, I'm, this is a little too much. Um, that's just the, telling you about the NAM-NAG connection, but I don't want to go into that. And it's extremely important 
in um, promoting the structure of the organism, whether it's, uh, it's round, like a cocci, or a bacillus, like a rod, or a spirochete, like this character over here, all of it is, is, is promoted through peptidoglycan. And this is the lady that got the Nobel Prize for having first discovered toll. And toll was discovered not having anything to do with innate responses or protection. It was really discovered because it was responsible for dorsoventral development of the fruit fly as an embryo. So if you knock out toll, you get this, and there's no development. So this lady got the Nobel Prize for that because that was then the, the, the groundwork on which Jules Hoffman's group continued looking at this from another perspective, and that has to do with protection. And this is a very sick uh, fly that got its toll knocked out and it couldn't withstand uh, fungal infection. So it's clear, toll plays a major role in protecting the fruit fly from fun fungi. And this is really uh, early stages of understanding the signal transduction pathways for tolls. I want to get to this. Now why is this important? All the, the other two are important, but they're too complex. I want to get to the bottom. The, the, the bottom line to all of this. So here you've got an agonist. An agonist is anything that will react with a receptor, that will promote signal transduction. An antagonist is something that will block it. So in this case, let's call this a PAMP. Let's call it, call it LPS, okay? And this is a receptor. Let's call this TLR2. Let's say it homodimerizes. What happens is there are other adapter molecules below this that get phosphorylated. There's something called MyD88, and followed by TIRAP, followed by other things. They get phosphorylated. That's the signal transduction that I was talking about. At the end, this gets activated, this kinase, I-kappa B kinase. Now, why is that important? Kinase is an enzyme. But as an enzyme, what does it do? Under normal conditions, the NF-kappa B, the nuclear factor kappa B, is in the cytoplasm and it's bound to something called I-kappa B. As long as I-kappa B and nuclear factor kappa B are together <laughs> as a complex, there's no inflammation. There's nothing. Everything is normal, healthy, terrific. The moment the agonist binds to the receptor, and it activates the signal transduction pathway that I'm referring to, I-kappa B kinase gets activated. And what it does is it cleaves I-kappa B away from NF-kappa B. And the I-kappa B gets destroyed. It's, called, it's what's called ubiquitination, or you, it gets ubiquitinated. <coughs> It undergoes digestion. A cell has the capacity to digest things. So now the NF-kappa B is free. And what does it do? It goes into the nucleus to activate pro-inflammatory cytokine genes. Okay, so that's what this is all about. Do I make sense? Okay. And this is just to illustrate the point that there are different stages at which things get activated under uh, different conditions. Adherence to epithelium. So the first panel on the left is just to illustrate the fact that organisms will routinely bind to our surfaces. Okay? Now let's take the skin as an example. You've got staph epidermidis. It's a very, very good bug. It's kind of like certain streptococcal organisms that I'm going to be mentioning about the good guys in the oral cavity. The good guy on the skin is Staph epidermidis. The bad guy is Staph aureus. Okay? When it binds to the surface, 
the mucosa does nothing under normal conditions. Well, because there's a huge um, corneum layer on the skin, very, very thick corneum layer. But we don't have a very thick corneum layer in the oral cavity. So when bacteria bind to the mucosa in the oral cavity, there is a tickling, a tweaking of that mucosa. And that leads to a small but significant gradient of iolate. And this is unique to the mucosa of the oral cavity. No other mucosa has that property of being able to have a low grade gradient, if you will, of iolate. So I mentioned what iolate will do. It will bring in some PMNs. And so the only mucosa in the body where you see PMNs under normal conditions surveying the territory is the oral mucosa. So that's really an important uh, uh, distinction. So this is really for purposes of other mucosa, but I want to make it clear that in the oral mucosa, there is a reaction with an iolate gradient that brings, percolates those PMNs from the bloodstream. Not a lot, but enough to perform surveillance purposes. Now, what happens here? You get a wound, okay? Someone bites you, some animal, <laughs> right? Something happens, it breaks the surface. Now organisms are trying to get in, okay? They're trying to penetrate into the underbelly of that mucosa. What do you, what do you see here? Describe to me what you see here in the early stages. I mean, you can read it here. Dendritic cell response. A dendritic cell, an initial dendritic cell response. This is a little premature. This happens here under local infection more than it does under the initial stages. This happens a little later. But let's assume you're right. There's some dendritic, the local Langerhans cells are identifying it. You can see parts of the bug on, on here. But well, what is this? So, yeah, that's a PMN. So I mentioned to you those, those PMNs that are percolating in, they're starting to get activated. They're starting to take in those organisms. Another thing that happened is those antimicrobial peptides that I mentioned to you before, they get released. Okay? And they're killing off bacteria that are trying to get in there. And it does also say the complement gets activated. I'm going to leave that for Dr. Levine, and then I'm going to come back and reemphasize it at a later date. Then you've got local infection tissue. Now you've got a localized infection. Now you've got the dendritic cells playing a very, very important role because they're the ones that bridge from this stage into this stage. They're the ones that now are taking stuff to the lymph nodes to activate clonal expansion within the lymph nodes for T cells and T cells. Okay? You've also got cells coming in. I don't know, have you heard of natural killer cells? NK cells? Okay, so they're starting to come in. Okay? There's activation of macrophages that's, that happen. There's MHC class 1 and 2 that interact with T cell receptors for cytokine release, right? So all of a sudden here, you're starting to get cytokines released, a greater gradient of IL-8 is produced. There's a gradient of something called IP10, which is a chemokine for T cells from that epithelium. All of that gets activated here. And then over here, you're already, you're already starting to see antibodies being produced, right? So this is the entire gamut of innate immunity bridged by those dendritic cells, the antigen-presenting cells, including macrophages, that lead to adaptive immune responses. Another way to look at it is on a time horizon. Zero to four hours, an initial infection is occurring. It's recognized by these preformed nonspecific effectors, those AMPs, those antimicrobial peptides. 
that get released, they're preformed. They're just released to meet within a matter of minutes to remove the infectious agent. If that doesn't succeed, a little bit later, somewhere between 4 and 96 hours, there's recognition of these microbial associated molecular patterns. And now that leads to inflammation. And through inflammation, there is recruitment of effector cells. So you're going from preformed effectors, which are the molecules, to cells. And then if that doesn't work, the adaptive immune system starts kicking in after 96 hours. With transport of antigen to lymph organs, by antigen presenting cells, primarily dendritic cells, activation of, of clones of B and T cells, clonal expansion, and removal of the agent. So that's it. Do you guys want to take a break? Yeah. Yeah, I'm starting to sense there's people are okay. All right, so we'll uh, we'll continue after. Here's about the uh, oral mucosal strategy. We'll start getting into parts of the saliva, like mucin and lysozyme and things like that. So what do I mean by oral mucosal strategy? It's pretty self-explanatory. You've got the fluid phase, which is made up of um, liquid emerging from serous glands and the parotid is the major serous gland generator. You've got mucus uh, coming from submandibular and sublingual glands as well as some serous coming from them because they're serous mucus kinds of, of glands. And they're producing what we call the mucins and the saliva there are two types. We'll talk about MG1 and MG2 and what roles they play. Within this fluid phase are a lot of the agents we're going to be talking about. Notice that secretory IgA I put here. Now that is not part of the innate immune system. All right. So just because it's there doesn't mean that it is part of the innate immune system. It's clearly part of the adaptive immune system. What do you think secretory IgA does in the context of saliva? and the oral cavity. Have you heard of secretory IgA? Have you heard of IgA? It's an immunoglobulin. Okay. What do you think it does in the context of, of uh, the oral cavity? It's antibacterial. What did you just say? It attaches to bacteria. Yes, it does. So yes, it does. It, it, it will bind to bacteria. It will assist in the removal of bacteria. It will cause clumping of bacteria that we can then swallow to a great degree like what mucins will do. So secretory IgA plays a very, very important role here. And we'll talk about secretory IgA in the context of caries as well. Um, then you've got the static phase, and the static phase I call the static phase really the mucosa. Now, it's static only because it's structural, but it isn't static from the perspective of activity. It's very dynamic, like I showed you before. If you get a wound here, or there's an abrasion, these amps that are preformed in these cells will be released. Some are very, very good at killing bacteria. Some, in addition to being antibacterial, play a role in the mobility. Here you see the mobile phase, the recruitable phase. They play a role in bringing in specific cells, like PMNs or monocytes, that then become macrophages or T cells. Okay, So you've got the ability to protect the oral cavity in multiple different ways. The fluid phase, which we'll talk about, the static phase that gets activated with amp release, and the recruitable defense phase where cells come in that have a role to play in eradicating the infection. And what we're going to be talking about in the salivary constituents is nothing up here, but we'll talk about things that play antiviral roles, antifungal roles, and antibacterial roles. 
And the agents themselves, we're not going to be talking about back antibodies. Um, this falls under salivary factors that are not specifically innate. So antibodies are clearly there because they bind bacteria. Um, cystatins. We'll talk about cystatins later. These are agents that can neutralize bacterial enzymes. Now, one of the things that is very, very important to understand, if you take periodontal disease on the one hand, and you take caries on the other hand, from a bacterial perspective, how do you differentiate bacteria that play a role in this versus bacteria that play a role in this? What do you think? The proteins they express. Just look at the bacteria from a gram-positive, gram-negative perspective. We'll start with that. Caries, periodontal disease. It's pretty clear cut. It's not 100%, but it's, damn, it's darn close. Caries, periodontal disease. What? Just about. Which means? Caries is gram positive. Is it yes. aerobic, anaerobic? Yes, absolutely. So that's the other element of it. You've got a shift from gram positive, aerobic, fermentative kinds of organisms into gram-negative, anaerobic, and this is a real uh, sophisticated word, chemo-organotropic organisms, which means that they use a lot of enzymes to break up peptides, i.e. ground substance, the periodontium, the gingiva. So these organisms have an armamentarium of enzymes, these gram-negatives that are involved in periodontal disease. Gram-negative, anaerobic, to a great degree. Some are more anaerobic than others. I'm generalizing, but this is a good way to understand the concept of the shift from gram-positive, aerobic, fermentative kinds of organisms to gram-negative, anaerobic, chemoorganotropic. That's what's the flow of what's happening from, from uh, caries to periodontal disease. And to a great degree from super gingival plaque to subgingival plaque. Okay? Am I making sense? Okay. And so these cystatin molecules are there to neutralize a lot of the enzymes that the gram-negative anaerobic Chemoorganotropic organisms involved in periodontal disease produce. We'll talk about that. defenses. These are preformed antimicrobial uh, agents that are positively charged, cationic, highly cationic. And the reason I'm m mentioning that is because bacterial membranes overall are net negatively charged. The LPSs, the LTAs, the lipoproteins, these are net negatively charged. So you've got electrostatic interactions occurring between these preformed amps and the surfaces of the bacteria. And when they, that happens, you've got these agents that can come in, and just like a <coughs> complement, they can poke holes in the membranes of the bacteria. Histatins, we're going to talk about. These are antifungal really great agents to keep the fungus at bay. Over 50% of humankind carries fungi in their mouths, and yet they don't have candidiasis because the fungi are in yeast mode. Someone's going to talk to you about fungi later in the course. So just to remind you, fungi undergo through the, this process of changing their shape. When they're a yeast form, they're, they're, they're um, passive. They play the role of commensal microflora. If they become opportunistic for multiple different reasons, one of which is misuse of antibiotics, so you clear out a lot of bacteria that play the role of suppressing the fungus, now all of a sudden the fungus can thrive. And it shifts from a yeast form to a hyphae form. 
And that hyphae is like a, a spear going into a cell. So the candidiasis that you'll occasionally see in, in clinics because of malformed dentures that we'll talk about a little bit. And so the fungus is growing underneath the palate, for example, and on the surface of the denture. Um, the histatins can't get there. Um, so histatins play a very, very important role in <coughs> maintaining that balance in regards to the fungal microflora. Lactoferrin, as I said, binds iron. We'll talk about that. Lysozyme, licensed bacteria. Mucins, non-specifically attract, uh, entrap and aggregate microbial particles so that we can, uh, we can uh, swallow them. And these two guys, very important in anchoring molecules to the tooth. Those first um, bacteria, the, the, the so-called good guys that have a predilection to these molecules, they're the originator. They start the salivary pellicle and uh, the good biofilm forming on the tooth. All right, this is a very busy slide. My apologies. What do you need to know? Bottom line. Mucins, other than lubricating um, the oral cavity um, and being important in speech and swallowing, and in clearance of microbes. That's the emphasis for us. Clearance of microbes. What are they? They're glycoproteins. Okay, they vary in the amount of sugar depending on which kind of molecule we're talking about, either Mg1 or Mg2. Okay. Now, think about this. I'll cut to the chase. You've got a backbone of protein, a peptide. Segments of that peptide are connected by um, sulfide bonds. If you remember in your biochemistry days, when cysteine and cysteine are next to one another, they cause disulfide bonding. So you've got part of the peptide here, part of the peptide here, part of the peptide here, disulfide bonding between them. Wherever there is a serine or threonine amino acid on the chain of the protein backbone of the mucin molecule, there is going to be a polysaccharide attached to it. So you're going to have sugar attached to either serine or threonine. And the amount of that sugar depends on whether you're talking about Mg1 or Mg2. That's what this slide is about, okay? Uh, in terms of size, this tends to be bigger than this. By the way, in the literature, Mg1 is also called Mach5b, Mg2 is called Mach7. This has to do with the biochemists who first discovered and, and, and identified them. They have the right to call it whatever they want. So this is what I'm referring to as an as, as a easier way to explain how mucins are very complex molecules. They're huge. They're like a million dal Dalton in size. The amps, for example, with five Dalton in size. Compare that to a huge molecule like a, a million Dalton in size. And so these are very complex. This is the backbone, a protein that I'm mentioning to. Here is the disulfide bonds. These are the poly... Uh, saccharide side chains that emerge off of either serine or threonine amino acids. And one other thing that I forgot to tell you. At the tips are sialic acid residues. Now why is that important? Because sialic acid is predominantly gram negative. No. Predominantly negatively charged. Okay? Negatively charged. And I'll explain why that is important in the context of protection of the mucosa. So keep that in mind. This is just a table to make it more complex, I guess. MG1, MG2, I put this together based on the, the classifications of these things from the literature, the molecular weight, the protein content, the carbohydrate, uh, the number of residues of, of oligosaccharides, the numbers, uh, all that sort of good stuff. But down here, 
is what's important. In general, Mg1 plays a very, very important role in pellicle formation. And Mg2 plays a very, very important role in bacterial clearance. So what I'm getting at is that Mg1 likes to coat the mucosa. And Mg2 And so, I'm sorry, Mg1, in terms of salivary pellet, likes to coat the tooth, as well as the mucosa. Mg2 likes <coughs> to clear bacteria in the fluid phase, meaning in the, in the saliva, which means Mg2 has the ability to expose epitopes on this complex molecule that bacteria like to bind to. Am I making sense? No? Not so much? So going back to that previous image, yeah. as that thing's rolling around in situ, is it attaching to bacteria as a snare, or is it pulling it in because of the negativity of its residue? Uh, no, it, I'll tell you about the negativity part of it. That has to do with the other innate response elements that tend to be highly cationic. Okay, these are mostly these, just bristles. The, yeah, so these... These guys will form certain parts of them that will be recognized by bacteria to bind to. And they will, so you can have multiple bacteria attaching to one, one of these big complex molecules. Exactly. So the, the, the reason I said sialic acid residues at the tips is because they play a role in binding a lot of the innate response molecules in order to concentrate concentrate them on the mucosal surfaces. It's another way to uh, defend that mucosa. This is what I'm getting to. So Mg1 tends to be closely associated with the mucosa. It serves as a barrier against toxins, enzymes, etc. Traps various host defense factors. That's what I'm referring to. It traps them because it has the ability to bind electrostatically to those cationic innate response elements. So now you can get all kinds of things closely concentrated, highly concentrated, to the surface of the mucosa. Providing high concentration of these factors near the surface. Secretory IgA has been found to also be associated within this mucosal layer overlying the epithelium. <coughs> it's another strategy. Both the secretory IgA and the innate response elements that I'm going to be referring to have a predisposition to bind to Mg1 close to the mucosa. And they found that in solution, this guy forms complexes with various proteins. So these guys are all highly positively charged. So now you've got Mg1 being able to bind a lot of these agents that play a role in protection. So Mg1 is a conduit by which these agents increase their concentration on the mucosal surface. Okay, now we're talking about dental pellicle. The salivary pellicle is about one to two microns uh, in, in thickness. It contains a lot of these different agents in them. The ones that we're going to be focusing on in regards to bacterial binding is proline rich peptides and statherin. And the take home message here that this pellicle plays a very, very, very important role in selecting out those early colonizers that have a high affinity for these anchoring molecules. Now, this is something really interesting. I'm focusing now attention on Mg2. Mg2 presents identical surface carbohydrates that the bacteria bind to 
as Mg1 does when it binds to T. So what Mg2 is doing is that it will um, outwit the bug in a sense. The bug is thinking, oh, I'm binding to this Mg2 thinking that it's on the tooth. But in, re but in reality, it is in the fluid phase. So what Mg2 is doing is binding a lot of bacteria that have yet to colonize the surface of the tooth or the mucosa. And by doing this, it will lead to the removal of a lot of these bacteria. So essentially, the Mg2 in the fluid phase is out there collecting organisms that we then eventually swallow. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's really, really neat stuff. Mg1, believed to protect mucosa by preventing viral infection. This was really big in the early 80s when HIV was prominent um, and was being discovered. And um, uh, some of the stuff that I'm referring to, like this and uh, histatins, which we'll talk about, antifungal agents, uh, have been shown to be affected by um, HIV. And I'll refer to that when we get to histatins. But back in the 80s, I don't know how much you've read about the HIV epidemic back in the 80s. And I was just starting my career back then, and it, it, it was really, really a, a severe situation where people were afraid to go to the dentist because of the possibility of, of, of getting HIV. Either the dentist getting it from a, from a patient who's HIV positive or vice versa. But what was discovered was that the oral cavity of all the orifices in the body, in the human body, is to a great degree immune, if you will, that's not the right word, uh, it is protected, if you will, from HIV. And no one has really identified any specific agent other than seeing that the saliva, and to some degree the amps, play a collective role in inhibiting HIV. And one of the things that these guys, Mandel and Ellison in 85, seem to have identified is that if you coat the HIV with MG1, you inhibit its ability to infect. And in fact, that's true, but it's very nonspecific. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Serous secretions. It's exclusively provided, well, no, that's not true. There's, the other salivary glands have some serous acidity in them, but primarily the parotid gland is where the serous secretions uh, uh, predominantly come from. And what's interesting is that the parotid acidity contain cells that release lysozyme, hist histatins, salivary peroxidase, Lactoferrin cystatins, pearly rich peptides. I didn't talk about this, calprotectin. Um, I'll talk about it in, re in regards to uh, antimicrobial peptides, because it is one of those. Uh, it also is a place where secretory IgA gets released, because there are B cells that become plasma cells when activated in the vicinity of the acidity, and they re release these IgAs into the saline. So they're primarily um, those secretions. Okay. Now we're going to do a shopping list of things and um, just bear with me. There's a lot of stuff here, but I'll tell you what's real important. Lysozyme. So lysozyme is a molecule that likes to do something that is pretty, pretty, pretty unique. Now, remember I said cationic protein? Okay, so that's an example of the kind of molecule that's going to be bound by Mg1 because of the electrostatic interaction. You're going to see lysozyme concentrated close to the mucosal membrane. So lysozyme, I don't know if you've ever done uh, 
a, uh, an experiment in undergrad when you took micro and you took, say, gram-positive organisms. There are certain organisms that are very, very sensitive to lysozyme because their peptidoglycan layer is very much exposed. Not all streptococci have their peptidoglycan so extremely exposed as the figure that I showed you before. That was just for demonstrative purposes. Uh, but there are certain ones that are. And the idea here is to take those types of bacteria and add some lysozyme in it. And what you'll see is it'll clear. That fuzzy fluid will now all of a sudden clear and you'll get a precipitation. And that's an example of what the lysozyme is actually doing. So the lysozyme binds to the beta-1,4 linkages between NAM and NAG. N-acetylmeramic acid, N-acetylglucosum. N-acetylmeramic acid, N-acetylglucosum. Chains of the stuff. All right? That's called transglycosylation. So between a NAG and <laughs> NAG, the bond is this beta-1,4 linkage between an AM and an AC. Okay? Now, if you remember peptidoglycan, it's more than just one chain of nam nags It's multiple chains of nam nags And between one chain and another chain below it, there is transpeptidation, where one NAM above binds to one NAM below through transpeptidation, which is a uh, four amino acid peptide. NAM to NAM. Here it's NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, and here it's NAM, 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 NAM. So now you get kind of like a, a sieve. And that, when it's structured properly, is very rigid. What lysozyme likes to do, and you can see it here, as I've indicated, is one molecule will sit in this kind of uh, trench, and it will destroy six beta-1,4 linkages at one time. Cleaves beta-1,4 linkage between anion and bacterial cell wall. Protein contains deep groove capable of binding six sugar units. That's what I just said. So if it splits those six, now you've got a disrupted peptidoglycan. And eventually, the bug will implode. Does that make sense? Yes? And that is what I'm referring to, where lysozyme acts. And right here is the four amino acid peptide that, uh, in that one NAM and the other NAM, there's a chain here and there's a chain here. Now, if you think about antibiotics, have you had any, any lectures on antibiotics yet? Briefly. Briefly, okay. So, there are antibiotics, and you know antibiotics are really bactericins. They're produced by bacteria to kill off other bacteria. And in the 20th century, the, probably the most important single discovery to save lives were antibiotics that were discovered as agents that bacteria produced to kill off other bacteria. So we took advantage of that. And some of the, bact some of the antibiotics that we prescribe as dentists, like penicillins, beta-lactams, right? glycopeptides, these are agents that will destroy peptidoglycan. So they're very, very good against gram-positive gram bacteria. So some of them will affect the transglycosylation in this region. So it's not just lysozyme. We have an agent in innate immunity, which we produce, that can do that. Bacteria have an agent, which we took advantage of, that can do the same thing. And then there are antibiotics that will affect transpeptidation. All right? So if you know 
what peptidoglycan is, you can begin to understand the mechanisms and the, the, the strategies by which bacteria kill one another and by which we utilize these antibiotics to destroy um, the, that structure. That's why I harp on this. Lactoferrin. So, what you see, first of all, where is it produced? I'm not so much interested in you knowing this, this sort of stuff. But it, it is an iron chelating glycoprotein. That's what you need to know. It plays a role in sequestering iron away from organisms, from bacteria primarily, also fungi. Where's, where do you see it? You see it in neutrophils. In those granules, those lysosomal granules, that are used to destroy a phagocytosing organism. So if you get a professional phagocyte, one of the things that it does, the first thing is that it phagocytoses the bug. It brings it in. You get a phagosome-lysosome interaction. The lysosome contains a lot of the agents that I'm referring to, lysozyme being one of them and lactoferrin being another one. So when I say it's produced by neutrophils and granules, I mean those lysosomal granules that function to destroy a phagocytosing organism, because you want to digest it. Right? If a myeloid cell has it, then the myeloid cell eventually is going to present all these different antigens on the surface of its cell to activate T cells. So you need these granules to have a lot of things that we have in saliva. So this redundancy here, in order to get a, uh, an active adaptive immune response. Its activity is to block the growth of iron-dependent organisms, like Candida albicans and Porphyrmonas gingivalis. So what you see here is the molecule itself. And there are two sites for the ferrous ion to be sequestered into. So each molecule has two sites for the iron uh, ion or the ferrous ion ion to get trapped. And this is another busy slide. What do you need to know about this? So salivary peroxidase falls under the category of enzymes called catalases. And catalases are enzymes that will catalyze the reduction of hydrogen peroxide to water. Now, why is that important? It turns out that there are gram-positive bacteria that produce a lot of hydrogen peroxide. Now, the reason for doing it, to a great degree, is to protect themselves from gram-negative bacteria that don't like to thrive in highly oxygenated areas, right? So one of the important things that I want to bring to your attention, oftentimes when there are congenital defects in babies, you learn a tremendous amount about the importance of the defect itself so that you can better understand when that agent is there, the role it plays. So if a baby is acatalysemic, born with a deficiency in catalase, what do you see? The presentation is extensive ulceration of oral tissues. That's really neat. Extensive ulceration of, of oral tissues. And the reason for it is because a lot of the organisms that we have produce hydrogen peroxide. And if we don't have a way to balance that, to, re to catalyze that hydrogen peroxide into water, we will get ulcerations. And that's a presentation you will see in acatalysemic babies. Does that make sense? Tell me if I'm not making sense. So that, this is the most important take-home message on, on this slide. 
When you see these sorts of things, that's because I summarize stuff from the literature about take-home messages regarding this topic. And you can go to these references to get more information. Some people believe that aphthous ulcerations, remember aphthous ulcerations in the oral cavity? Huh? Canker sores, right? So some people believe that, if you look at this paper, that it has to do with organisms that are producing locally a lot of hydrogen peroxide. So if you take catalases and treat them, this paper will tell you that they've reduced the, the aphthous ulceration uh, incidence uh, significantly. Histatins. I think I'll end with this. I'm tired, you're tired, right? I got a grant that has to go out tonight. Okay, last thing, histatins. Why is this important and what are they? Histatins come from the, essentially come from the word histidine. They're histidine-rich peptides. Histidine-rich alpha helical peptides. This is the range of amino acids that these molecules make. There are two families based on their sequences. They're produced by salivary gland epithelium. Okay, salivary gland epithelium. They're found in acini from the parotid glands and the submandibular. This is the normal amount in a healthy individual on a microgram per ml of saliva basis. Strong anti-candidal peptides. Their activity is to neutralize candida. Now, how do they discover this? This is something really interesting. Frank Oppenheim from a BU, uh, I think he's retired now, was a really good biochemist, dentist, and he uh, was instrumental in doing something very, very simple, but very important. Anti-histidine -hist immunoaffinity adsorption of saliva removes candidocidal activity. That says it all. Anti Histatin immunoaffinity adsorption of saliva removes candidocidal activity. Has anyone ever done experiments in their uh, undergrad days where you took a column and the column had something in it to absorb out something that was going through the column? Did you ever do that? You did that, right? Okay, that's, that's what that is. Immunoaffinity adsorption. Immunoaffinity means that in the column, there's something. It could be an antibody, right? It could be beads with some substrate that has already been created by a company to selectively bind to something that's going through the column. That's what immunoaffinity absorption is. So what he did was he created a column with antibodies to histatins. He took saliva, passed it through the column, and then he collected what came through the column. He tested for anti activity, the original saliva, and what came through the column. And he reduced the activity by greater than 90 some percent. Okay, so that was pretty convincing that indeed this histatin plays a major role in candidocidal activity. So uh, that's what that's about. And then Mandel, at all in 92, found, interestingly enough, that a decrease in salivary histatins was associated with an increased incidence of candidiasis secondary to HIV. One of the telling signs, and I tell this to a lot of dental students, and I saw it in, in practice, one of the first signs of immunocompromisation in a patient is candidal infection. You will see it on the tongue as a white patch that if you take and scrape it, it will bleed. Immediately find out if this patient has any kind of immunocompromised condition. That is a telling sign for HIV. Okay, so if you believe Mandel in 92, who put together this paper, 
demonstrating that in those cases of HIV infection, and they don't know why, his statins are low in these, in these individuals. Okay? Another thing that's important, dentures cover palate and prevent access of parotid saliva. When you study to make dentures, and God bless you if you become good at it, <laughs> there's something you need to avoid. And that is the flanges that are on the side make certain that they don't cover the exits of the tubes from the parotid gland into the mouth, into the oral cavity. What happens is that in those cases where parotid fluid can't get in and under the palate, what's going to happen is you're going to get candidal <coughs> infection. You're going to get candida growing on the inner surface of the denture. And that's going to create irritation and localized uh, inflammation. Discomfort, tremendous discomfort on the part of the patient. So all of these things are telling you the importance of the statins. I don't know when we're going to see each other again. I think it's going to be sometime next week. And we'll continue with this, and we'll get into, hopefully, the beginning of Curies. All right? Thanks for your attention. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you.